Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Mau Mau Hour with Pascal Robert. As you know, the first part of the show, or I should say the first part of the show, this show is a patrons only show that we do air uh, once we're finished. But the whole point of the show is that when Pascal goes on his rants, so to speak, you guys interact with them in real time. That's why the chat is on the screen. Because Pascal will be responding once he is done with his rant. I shouldn't say rant. What are we gonna, with his editorial. So we're going to call it his editorial. Sorry. I apologize. I'm wearing this and not sweating because my house is cement. And it's really cold. And I haven't left in several days to go buy slippers or thick socks. So I'm freezing. And on that note, I don't want to waste any time because time is of the essence. We want to get down to business. Please welcome the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings to Jason Miles. I also want to show off this gorgeous view that keeps me sane. I see really Shirley. Cool. Hello, Shirley. Hello, Joaquin Chavez. Hello, our regular Dr. Claw. What's going on? I see Gene Bajlon, Lever Action Radical. I see you all. Welcome that is who, the the Jean. So Jean Bajlan, let's let's give a shout out real quick. Jean Bajlan, shout out for doing all of the kind of back end producing for the show in the last like three months. Jean Jean, sorry, Jean, that reminds me too much of home, doesn't it? But. Seriously, Gene makes all these thumbnails for us, even though he's still wrestling with uh, his his small, not yet three year old, and the newborn, and his wife that is healing still. So shout out, and he's still teaching those badass kids at Missouri State University. So shout out to Gene Bajlan, thank you so much. Shout out to Gene for real, major asset to us, and this is the revolution. Aqui Nokwe, I only didn't shout you out because your name is too complicated for me to pronounce. So, don't say that. <laughs> so I, on that note, I'm going to get off the screen and let Pascal do his thing. Comrades, friends, brothers and sisters, all of the above. Today we're going to have a serious conversation about a serious subject matter. Today, we're going to do an analysis of a phenomenon that I don't think has transpired enough throughout history, yet the necessity of this phenomenon has become endemically more necessary. I will use some examples throughout history one is going to be from the Haitian Revolution and the other is going to be from the actual Kenyan Liberation Front, which was the Mau Mau Rebellion. And we're going to talk about some theory that radical left revolutionaries have put forth in the past on dealing with this phenomenon. The subject matter of today's Mau Mau Hour is based on a simple question. And I want our this is revolution family because we we all understand this is open to everyone. This we don't want to engage in racial essentialism, but we're going to deal with the material reality of the way in which blacks and the African diaspora are utilized in international capitalism and domestic capitalism in a way 
that causes certain internal contradictions in black diasporic life, more complicated to negotiate. So this question is gonna be basically relegated to a conversation within the context of diasporic black society, which does not mean that non-members of diasporic black society shall not be able to comment. We want you to comment. But the question will become, and we will address this question down the line, is will non-black diasporic members of society, i.e. whites and non-blacks, be able to engage in the process that I may be proposing in this show? And we will get to what that process is. The question that we're going to surmise in today's program, the Mau Mau Hour, what are black and brown people who are exploited in capitalism domestically or internationally to do with those of their various identities, tribes, cultures, or religions that collaborate with the forces of oppression that are rendering them to misery and suffering in their respective lands. What do I mean by collaborator? Let's take a trip through history. With the example of the transatlantic slave trade, I am not one of these people who were like, oh, the Africans were selling each other to, to the whites. If you actually read, there's a really good book by a Muslim Senegalese woman. Her name is Sylvain Diouf. The book is called Servants of Allah. And it talks about the role of African Muslims in the transatlantic slave trade. And one of the things she talks about is that if you understand how the transatlantic slave trade correlates to internal collapse of particularly certain West African empires, many of them Muslim, not all of them, and how the arrival of the European on the African continent and his ability to be able to take advantage of the, the collapsing of these empires and provide weaponry, i.e., for example, gunpowder and other forms of coercion to rival African tribes that had already been in competition, you will see that the presence of the European on the African continent exacerbated already existing tribal conflicts and made them worse and made a motivation to engage in competing tribal, rival tribes, selling of enslaved Africans to Europeans possible. So we have to understand something, and this is something is very difficult within the context of America. Because in America, we have a very binary understanding of race, meaning that there is black and there is white. He's black, she's white, she's not black enough, she's not black. But we have to just put this in our consciousness. People who are descended of the African continent before the transatlantic slave trade did not refer to themselves as black. That was not an identity that was in their conscience. If you were Senegal, living in Senegal or Senegalese, you would consider yourself Wolof or Pur or Fulani. If you were in Guinea, you might say you were Mandinka. If you were in an area that we call Nigeria now, you might say you were Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba. In other words, the African continent is a continent with over 3,000 different tribes and languages. When you realize, you understand that the capacity to reduce a place of that space, where you can literally fit several nations on that continent to a flattened notion of blackness, does a disservice to the multiplicity of cultural differentiation that exists on the African continent. 
That being said, when you consider the way in which the collapse of these Muslim and non-Muslim empires on the African continent were being exacerbated by the introductions of weapons, particularly guns and gunpowder by Europeans, who were profiting from internal collapse as well as conflicts that had already existed in various tribes and nation states, then it makes this ridiculous of like, oh, they sold my grandmama notion kind of ridiculous. Because what you don't understand is that a Mandinka from Guinea looks like looks at a Wolof from Senegal, barring that they may be Muslims, the same way that a French Catholic might look like an Irish look at an Irishman who's a Catholic. They're not the same people. But because we have this kind of flattened notion of blackness, we've rendered African diasporic identity to a very flat notion. And because in America, the racial strife in this country renders race to this kind of binary, kind of semi-ontological black versus white. When I say ontological, it means that it feels like it's along it's like physics, like earth science this black white binary conflict we don't understand that these are socially constructed identities and that in europe frankly the british or the germans or certain certain nation states will be treating other europeans like Pol- polish people or slovak people or bosnians like the n word if you will of that particular region. So not only is black identity flattened as a consequence of the transatlantic slave trade, white identity is flattened as a consequence of the transatlantic slave trade. But in the reality of the fact that the process of the transatlantic slave trade post slavery the new world has been over a 500 year process. There are certain material realities that have come to pass that have created hierarchies of racial oppression in the Western world based on the charade of whiteness and the charade of blackness that have had materialist political ramifications. So the question becomes, in the context of that post-transatlantic slave trade reality after 500 years, where we have a concept of a black identity, where we have a concept of a white identity, and we understand that these socially constructed realities have been used in the capitalist imperialist paradigm to render those who have been relegated to the black identity to a certain position in global capitalism and imperialism where they have been extracted in terms of resources and wealth and their image because it is easier to separate from the dominant norm of whites have been made to be a concept of negative value in the consciousness of the world there's a certain material reality to the way in which black people are viewed globally Fanon talks about this. The question becomes, what is the most effective way to remove people who are descended from diasporic Africans from the conundrum of this capitalist and imperialist-based oppression that uses the charade of whiteness as the choke point. My proposition here is to say this, the capacity of the European descendant imperial power to enact this particular race-based 
oppression rooted in capitalist extraction does not exist without the black and or brown collaborator with the forces of empire. So yes, in the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, we would not fought the African because of the way in which the European comes in during a period of internal tribal strife. But what happens when you, after 200 years of exporting blacks, we're seeing certain African kings who are consciously engaging in the slave trade, who are profiting from it. When we see certain tribal chiefs engage in exacerbation, Yes, we're not going to come into some kind of collective African blaming, but at a certain point, we may say these individuals acted as collaborators with the system of oppression. So the question becomes, within a reality in which diasporic Blackness internationally is rendered to a racialized redundancy Black people are treated like crap all over the world. Of course, it's materialist in its origins. The question becomes, what is the primary operating tool? What is the primary operating procedure in alleviating this material exploitation from black identity. I will posit to you that the primary step in the analysis of the post-colonial world we're in, when we consider the writings of Fanon, who warned about the neo-colonial bourgeoisie, when we consider the writings of Kwame Nkrumah, who wrote about the dangers of the neo-colonial bourgeoisie, When we consider the writings of Amilcar Cabral, who discussed the danger of the comprador bourgeoisie, when we consider the writing of E. Franklin Frazier, who talked about the bankruptcy of the black bourgeoisie in America, when we consider the writings of the Black Panther Party, like Huey Newton, George Jackson, who talked about the black bourgeoisie. When we consider the fact that we have a Syrian or Arab comprador bourgeoisie in Haiti and black mulatto and also black gundor collaborators, the question becomes, what is, what are the rules of engagement when it comes to the operational steps to liberate black and brown people from the conundrum of how international capitalism renders them disproportionately to all of the harms of redundancy. I would put to you And I would argue to you, and I'm very serious, I'm not playing games, that there's something that has not been effectively done that needs to be considered and it needs to be thought out in terms of how it's implemented and how it's done. What needs to be implemented, in my humble opinion, is that black and brown people need to engage in class warfare with the black and brown collaborator. The question becomes, what are the terms of this class warfare? And how does this class warfare manifest? Is it necessary? How is this class warfare effectively engaged in, in a society where the dominant force of power is still controlled largely by those who are 
aesthetically European in complexion? Does that diminish the utility of class warfare? Or does that make the need for class warfare more exigent? My position is this. In the period after the decolonial movements of the 60s and the radical period of the 60s, the fall of the Soviet Union and the increased grip of neoliberalism and the rise now of international reactionary whiteness, we have a conundrum. We're at a precipice. The black poor and working class that have been not only victimized by the Western empires of capital, but who have been victimized by the collaborators and compradors and bourgeoisies, black, brown, and otherwise in their communities that have collaborated with the, those forces of empire. At this moment, in the ride with the rise of reactionary white nationalism. What is the strategic move for that working class and poor black and brown international community diasporically? Is the move to engage in a popular front with those classes of black and brown elites that have betrayed them globally in a fight against white reactionary nationalism? Or is the reality realizing that those elites will only collapse with their little pleas for identity gravy and fat back and biscuits and their requests for inclusion, equity, diversity, and their desires to be simply raised up into the system, does it make sense to have a popular front strategy with these black and brown people? Or is it more logical to first give the political education to our black and brown working class and poor people globally? about the need to challenge the comprador bourgeoisie and the international petite bourgeoisie from their clan and tell them it is time to engage in class, class warfare. Now, class warfare does not have to start out or does, the goal is not to have it be violent. We are not saying that we want to shed blood of people. We want to avoid that. What we are trying to do is develop a political consciousness amongst the poor black and brown constituency of and the working class black and brown constituency who is savaged by the complicity of their comprador bourgeoisie and elites with the ruling class forces of capital and imperialism all over the world. We want to create a mechanism for those people to get the political education and awareness to politically, intellectually, socially, and if necessary, physically challenge those collaborators with the forces of oppression. And I think that for me, the first clarion call, and I plan to do this, I'm going to be writing a piece, I think I wanna do it this weekend, making the argument is why, as to why black and brown global class warfare is necessary. This is part two of the question, and this is the question we ask at This Is, and this is Revolution. Do the white, and alabaster com comrades engaged in this class warfare among the black and brown folk challenging their elites? Or is this the work of only the black and brown proletariat and lumpen proletariat? 
I, I ask your question and opinion. I'd like to hear the thoughts. So I've been going on for half an hour. Uh, Jason, you look like you want to jump in. You have some opinions and thoughts. Do you want me to continue with Campbell? What do you have? What are your thoughts, Jason? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you now. I just got the message that I got disconnected. So uh, I, I wanted to see what the other people had to say. When I say the upper whites took, it takes me a while. Gigi, when you do that thing where you go YTS, I read that as YTS. So let's write white. No code words here. The upper yits look down at the yits working class with all. He says the upper the upper class whites look down at the white working class with all their liberal virtue singing. Shirley says whites need to challenge white elites. If whites come for black elites, they'll be labeled as racists. Shirley makes a very good point. Matt L says like bougies need to prove their cred as class traders before we work with them. Well, that's a very good question. We can't go just willy nilly mow mowing people just because they have a couple of degrees and they're working as a teacher. Okay. What we have to do is to give them the opportunity of what Emil Carl Cabral suggested of committing class suicide. Meaning is that we have to give them the opportunity to illustrate their willingness to abandon their attachment to the accoutrement of petite bourgeois collaboration with the ruling class and demonstrate through indicated activity and political education that they are down with the agenda of the proletariat and the masses to challenge the forces of oppression. And then at that stage, they will be able to escape whatever manifestation of class warfare we're going to choose to engage with them. But if they refuse to engage in class suicide, that I think that they, at that stage, should be considered the enemy of the masses. Now, again, my position is that this, I'm not advocating that this process needs to become physical in the sense that we are doing harm to people physically. But what I'm saying is that the level of political discourse class consciousness and internal class exposure of these contradictions and antagonism must become leveled and increased in our writing, in our political education, in exposing the role of these collaborators with the ruling class and empire and demonstrate their treachery, challenging them politically in public thoroughfares and spaces and calling them out and make the consciousness aware of the proletariat masses of black and brown people, that the notion of racial kinship and affinity is dead, and those that are traitors to the goals of freedom and success and life of the poor and working class shall be challenged and fought regardless of their color. Can you see some of these comments on the screen, Pascal? Yes. Let me try. I'm Steve to, says, let me try I think to a, he, Steve let me says, try. I think to a large degree, working class blacks have a real disdain for upper class blacks. Look at the discourse around Obama and Kamala. I think it's the other way around. I think working class blacks were designed to be made to idealize and up. Look at the history. Let's look at black American political history. The concept of racial uplift, the kinds of quote unquote social control that organizations like the National Urban League and NAACP were engaging with around black people. Torrey Reed's book, uh, Not Arms But Opportunity, there's a very good expose on what the black elite thought their role was in engaging in uplift ideology of the black poor and working class. The problem is, is that the Obamas were considered to be made a model for the black working proletariat and poor, when actually their, their, their model serves the venal needs and desires of the black 
un petit bourgeois. Gigi, Gigi says, I wonder if that if is we working class non-white folk challenge the upper classes of non-white folks, then all we would have is white upper class folks. I think that makes sense. I think that makes sense. Yes, they, okay. Working class black people raise their children to work hard enough for them to join that class. Both black and white in America, there needs to be a lot of political education before we have enough to soar to win much of anything. I agree with you completely, Matt L. But that doesn't mean we doesn't mean we can't do two things at the same time. The ruling elites of oppressed minorities hate their own people the most. Gene Boswell, absolutely, I agree. Have you guys ever read my piece, Black Eugenics? How the black misleadership class of the early 20th century supported sterilization of the black poor under racial uplift. You should look up that piece. Type my name in Google and type black eugenics. You should read that piece. How they supported all kinds of racial purity hierarchies with eugenic better breeding to purify the race of the dysgenic black and brown folk. There's a very good book on that called In Search. I have the book right here. Here it is. In Search of Purity by Chantella Sherman. Popular eugenics and racial uplift among new Negroes, 1915 to 1935. GG uh, says Afro pessimism feels like black eugenics. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. That's, that's pretty damn funny. Uh, GG. Weird. What's weird, Justin Anderson? Eugenics? Well, we have an episode. I want to say it's episode 91, 92 with uh, Dr. Jeff Kennedy, who is an expert on eugenics. Um, Absolutely. And we had a pretty interesting show kind of going down a eugenic rabbit hole. Black eugenics being a thing. Oh, Oh, it's weird that black eugenics being a thing. You gotta get this book, in Search of Purity, Chantella Sherman. Chantella well, wasn't 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 uh, Du Bois a eugenicist? He was a eugenicist early on in the early twentieth century. That was like the hot science of the day, it though. It wasn't like you know you were a fringe thinker if you were a you, eugenicist. Du Bois was saying things like, "Black people think that they find happiness within numbers." Understands that people. Or like vegetables, quality is better than quantity. Matt L says, "Yes, yeah, seems like the way to go is do mutual aid organizing while trying to shoehorn in some holy till folks get political radicalized." Education. Oh, political education. Okay. Uh, what do you mean by mutual aid? I don't really like that term, mutual aid. I really, I really hate it. Not, not anything against you, Matt. I just, what do people mean by mutual aid? It's such an amorphous term that can mean so many different things. And I think people use mutual aid to be kind of a, a catch-all phrase for not really knowing what they mean. Matt, so please, what's up, Matt? Matt, you sound like you're not down with the hard body work of class warfare. What's going on here, man? We can't put this off. The time is now. But but what do like when you hear mutual aid, Pascal? I don't think you get as frustrated as me when you hear mutual aid, but I definitely do because I think it's just a term that's especially thrown around in the online space. Really I think much. people have adopted the, no, the notion of mutual aid that they got from the Black Panthers watching Judas and the Black Messiah in terms of food, free lunch programs and, and providing health care mm -hmm. and think that that's a solution for a uh, revolutionary class struggle. I mean, that also takes a lot of fundraising. Like, I yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, mutual aid, okay, yeah, whatever, that's fine. But how exactly do we engage in the process of class warfare? With the collaborators with the ruling class. Sorry, this I'm getting kicked off left and right. It is a, a busy night here in Baja, and the internet is kicking me off left and right. But Pascal, can you hear me? Yeah, that's just a good question. Dr. Claw comes read it. How is class war actually waged? Very good question. Again, our goal is to not to get physical or violent. Our goal, first of all, must be to inform the proletariat the, and the lumpen proletariat, the black working class and the poor, the brown working class and the poor, 
as to how historically the collaborators within their races and ethnicities have worked to their detriment. That means that we have to engage in, I, want to, I don't want to say propaganda, but we have to do media. We have to write articles. We have to do shows. If we're going to have this online left, let's use it for some radical political education. Well, isn't that what we had uh, Sam Cedar on to talk about? Like what happened when there was actually a real left online media space? Think how yeah. many people he was reaching or that that station was reaching when they were when they were doing their thing. I'm giving you an example. I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I think that piece I wrote in Newsweek is a nice salvo of class warfare. I think that just, we need to have more people analyzing how the black political class, the black media elite, work as collaborators and compradors and petite bourgeoisie against the issues of poor and working class black and brown folk. I'm sure the Latino American community has this problem. I'm sure the Asian American community has this problem. I'm sure the Muslim community has this problem. So the question becomes, how do we engage in the political education to heighten these contradictions globally across the board? Gene says, build alternative institutions to, to bourgeois dominated institution, but that is hard work. It is very hard work. This is not an it's easy It's extremely part. hard work. It's extremely hard work. And I think that's where that rhetoric of mutual aid tends to come in. And as as uh, oh, who who made that comment earlier? Who made that comment? Joaquin said, as Joaquin Chavez said, a lot of times mutual aid like kind of confuses just charity because it's hard to truly build those institutions. Well, this is complicated because Joaquin says the principal weapon of class warfare is the strike because the power elite is first and foremost the power claim. Well, that doesn't work within the context of internal black class warfare because the black petite bourgeois does not control means of production. His treachery is as a collaborator, as a petite bourgeois servant of empire. So his role is more social than it is really re rooted in material economic exploitation. Surely, well, can we provide an example of what a challenging the ruling class would look like? Uh, I think that if we had, if we could have, for example, let's, let's say we went to South Carolina, we went to Jim Clyburn's constituency, and we sat down, we got a school gymnasium, and we sat down the people from his constituency. And we talked about the condition and we videotaped it live on YouTube talking about what has Jim Clyburn done and not done in this constituency for his people. What has been his role in terms of collaborating with big pharma and black politics overall? Why has he supported these kind of candidates? Go into his hood and talk to the people there and see if they're willing to let's use spectacle to our advantage instead of being victims of spectacle. We don't want to do any kind of corny, ridiculous land back with nothing like that. But let's engage the populations in the spaces that they are and have them make rigorous political challenges to the efficacy of their black and brown political representatives and their utility to the forces that are grounding black and brown people to dust. Why can't we use spectacle in that capacity to our advantage? Gene Bosnell said, mutual aid isn't the problem. It's just the people using it as a slogan. Gene says, we need to build social institutions like the SPD did in Germany in the 19th century or the mining unions in the UK. I agree with that. Dr. Claus is there. There are a number of people, working class, by the way, local, local to Clyburn's district, challenging him on those grounds now. That's good. Let's heighten those contradictions and let's make them public and have them be exposed. 
We need to heighten the contradictions. You know? We need to heighten those contradictions. This is about discipline. Matt L., it's just like Jane McAvee talks about. At some point, you have to do real organizing, as in building person-to-person relationships. No doubt, Matt L., we've got to get off these internets, get off these YouTubes, and we have to go into communities and build with people, meet space, as my mentor Bruce Dixon used to call it. Meet space. Organize them. Take this political moment of crisis that we have in America today with all of these things, all of these cases about Rittenhouse, Armin Arbery, and don't fall into the kind of racial navel-gazing that the media wants you to. Flip it on its head and turn it into a moment to expose internal class contradictions, not only racial contradictions, and also expose the racial harm as well. Surely, brilliant, much like Cory Bush did with Lacey Clay. That's a we need to study that and that we need to study that example more. How did Cory Bush, a working class woman from St. Louis, dislodge a black political class dynasty? She engaged in class warfare. We have to study the Cory Bush model more effectively. And definitely institutions that revolve around the conditions of working class people, supporting unions. I could say, to your point about spectacle, what strategies can we come up with to immediately counteract the representation politics, diversity, inclusion, loving people that will not want to make spectacle? I think that we need to go, go into public media spaces and challenge them for their complicity. I don't have to say, I'm not arguing that I have all the answers, but I think that we need to really focus on making these internal class contradictions more explicit and don't fall into the trope that we need some kind of popular front united unity with these class enemies and collaborators with the ruling class simply because we fear the rise of the reactionary right when they will not be helpful to us in that cause anyway. I think this is a time and a moment for us to heighten the contradictions. Those class collaborators in the Democratic Party or whatever party they're in, they are the tools of those people. They don't represent the the issues and the concerns of poor, working class, black or brown, or even white people. And I think my position is that, yes, when we come to class warfare, we do not want white folk physically engaging and shouting down Clyburn. But I think in terms of exposing his role in sabotaging the lives of black and brown people, they can engage in that. But it's got to be done in a comradely way, and they have to gain the trust of the black proletariat and lumpen proletariat or the working class and poor, because it's not going to be easy for black folk to take criticisms of the black political class from white people. It won't work as effectively. Gene Bajan is correct. We need communities to trust us. We can't just go in and lecture them. This is where we will. I don't want to call it mutual aid, but community service. Picnics. Family. It doesn't have to be. A, it doesn't have to be a, some serious meeting where everyone's tense and pissed. Let's have a, you know, let's have a picnic. We get together and talk. Touch football. Invite people. Have a good time. A block party. A barbecue. I wouldn't say we hide in contradictions in professional spaces. I think we need to go to working class folk. It doesn't have to be an unpleasant engagement. Make it fun. I mean, I'm intense now, but I don't have to be the one in charge of, like, you know, the social meet, meet and greet. Hiking, that makes sense. Foosball, whatever. Um, what are you know, the little 
the little, you know, the guns that with the little, with the pellets of the country. Yeah, kid get-togethers, all that. I can think it can be done in a way where it doesn't have to be some kind of like laborious, difficult kind of like tense meeting, dance parties, whatever. I think the SNCC model, SNCC in the 60s is good. Do our political education around social events that are enjoyable. At these politics, we'll talk about, well, we can talk about politics at these picnics. Of course. We need to use language that people understand. People, that's right. People don't use words like proletarian and bourgeoisie. Working class, poor. I agree with Robert Booth on that. We've got to make our language accessible to the people. I think I think that yeah, someone said we need to use language people understand. Regular people, yeah, that's true. And uh I, I think this can, I think this is something we should think about. Heightening the contradictions of class collaboration by engaging in class warfare at the initial stage by having social functions functions to organize working class and poor people, none of that theory stuff, and talk about how these people are selling them out for their own interests. You know? And we need to start doing things like turning, like taking all this hoi polloi left theory and turning them into pamphlets, 500 words or less. Why is capitalism a property? What is a union? 500 words or less. How do you think it may be a lack of confidence and straight up apathy that causes working class people not to engage? I think no one's reached out to them. We got to organize them. Send Doug Lane to the black church. That's kind of (laughs) rich. Yeah, it doesn't have to be an unpleasant. Again, here's the thing. We're going to give, we're going to reach out to the petit bourgeois too. And we're going to give them the opportunity to do class suicide. We got we we're going to be fair. Give them the opportunity to do class suicide and give them a worldview. Listen, I went to a top 30 law school. I wasn't trained to go be no revolutionary it's because of my family background and the way I look at the world that I did. But we've got to get these people in a position where they're willing to do class suicide and be about the poor and working class and challenging those collaborators. And we also policy solutions, 500 words or less. What's a policy solution? 500 words or less. less. Universal health care. Federal jobs guarantee. Why are unions good for working class people? 500 words or less. Simple language. Pamphlets. Flyers. YouTube videos. Car- cartoon YouTube videos. Why, why, why are unions good for working class people? What's a federal jobs guarantee? Guaranteed housing. Why is capitalism bad for working class and poor folk? Heightening the contradictions. Gene says we should do a tour, Pascal on the road. This is kind of funny. I think we should really thinking about, be thinking about taking the way in which we deal with this. Because let's make this clear. If we agree that capitalism disproportionately renders blackness to the reserve army of labor, and that the black political class is the linchpin of social control of the black community, and also the linchpin in destroying left politics as they did in 2016 and 2020, and collaborating with the neoliberal faction of the left flank of capital. Don't we think exposing the black political class and, and, and radicalizing black working class politics and putting it in the left flank of the Democratic Party or further left, collapses the whole left flank of capital's ability to engage in social control of the black masses?
It's hard to convince the black political class of selling them out when they don't they, when they do deliver in some ways to communities. How are they delivering? Fat back and biscuits? Patronage from the corporate sector of the Democratic Party that they get through their churches, fraternities and sororities and HBCUs, racial uplift programs. Most of these communities are poor with horrible constituent services. Leftist tent revivals. Oh, well, you know. Uh, we've got to be willing to engage in the work of really talking about. I'm thinking about writing this piece this weekend. The, does, does, do black people need to engage in class warfare? Legal aid, that's a good, hey, legal aid. How about we actually got some lawyers to be able to do legal aid for people and do engage in class suicide and look at the world through the eyes of the, of the working class and poor black folk and brown folk and white folk. Someone said baubles with a narrative is sufficient distraction for the people regardless of class. Legal aid is a good one. You know what? Good, you know what's good about legal aid? It gives the petite bourgeois, black and brown professionals, the, the, the capacity to physically demonstrate their willingness to do class suicide by, perform, by performing services to poor and working class black and brown folk. So those kind of services, legal aid, medical services, clinics, provide getting the petite bourgeois black and brown folk to provide services to demonstrate their dedication to class suicide. Maybe an excellent vehicle, good idea. Social work, mental health, all that kind of stuff. Shirley thinks, I still think class suicide needs to be replaced with class liberation, more positive messaging. That's a fair critique, Shirley. Ezekiel Mordecai says his brother is a UPS employee, but anti-union. I get to figure out where he's getting the Kool-Aid. Yeah, that's a rough sell. Gigi said, we, I'll tell you, we got to create community-funded 501c3s so that this working class can get their money. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally down with um, credit unions. I'm not, af I'm not afraid of building institutions like credit unions, things of that nature, 501c3s. Gene Bosner is right. Class suicide is a bit heavy. Well, we, we're going to use that term for now. Class liberation. We, we, can change it to, we can change it up. So we say, I'm in a group of anti-capitalist therapists, lawyers, and social workers, and doctors working on a ton of thousands of people. Yeah, that's good. I saw that one. This technology and technology is underutilized in mutual efforts. Okay. Said two Terry Crews is giving out the Kool-Aid. That's funny. But I think that's what we would think about that. And we might want to continue this theme, class warfare on This Is Revolution, going down into the future. Do some writing and discuss it more. I like the reaction that we're getting so thus far. People aren't laughing out of the, out the box like, this is ridiculous. They're like, no, this makes sense. I see the way in which some folk who don't have a good materialist analysis of the condition of black people talking about, oh, the boule, the boule be selling us out. Yeah, the boule, it's more than just the boule. We got to talk about the whole internal infrastructure and class stratification that exists in the black community. Fraternities, sororities, churches, HBCUs, the Urban League, the civil rights organizations, the petite bourgeois membership organizations, the black church, and how they interact and work with the ruling class finance capital-based institution to, to render black politics in this corporate-friendly neoliberal way, whether you like to go to the SEP show or not, or you like your HBCU. I think what's going on at Howard University is a perfect example of internal class warfare with those students protesting the way they're being treated by the administration, horrible services and horrible housing. So uh, these are all methodologies. We got some good suggestions today. What can be, Gene says, what can be taken over and what can be replaced? Well, listen, guys, 
What, well, you know what? Let me know this. Let me know this was a good show. The hour is over. Let's wrap it up. This was a great conversation. And let's uh let's talk about this again. Thank you guys and have a very good evening. And hopefully you'll be spending tomorrow with your families, whatever you want to call that day. Pascal, do you have plans for tomorrow? I want to be with my mom and my brother and some family members. Yeah, happy holidays for those who celebrate. For those don't be offended, we said we gotta be go. Let's be kind of like, you know, human to each other. Some people still celebrate Thanksgiving. Some people don't. Whatever. Oh, sorry, it's really dry. Uh, okay. And on that note, don't forget, we will still have a show tomorrow night. Pascal and I had a great conversation with historian Jeffrey B. Perry, who wrote the two-volume uh, biography on Hubert Harrison. And we'll be airing that uh, six o'clock our normal time. And for all you patrons that are watching this, we actually have a patron bonus half. We didn't think we were going to have it. And we actually did uh, get some patron bonus half uh, content with Jeff. And we're probably going to be doing a series with Jeff next year um, on the life of Hubert Harrison. So that's that's exciting. Anything you want to say, Pascal? No, I really enjoyed this conversation. Y'all got me hyped. All right. And on that note, we are. Oh, I guess we're going to see him uh, officially Saturday. Yes. It's going to be a surprise show Saturday because we have to figure out what Saturday is going to be. What is Jason doing tomorrow? Absolutely nothing. I'll be here in Mexico with stores open and I'm going to go grocery shopping. And on that note, we are.